we do not have that, right? We do not have skilled personnel. So some of the procedures that I'll be speaking about just in a few require skilled personnel. We're looking at um, obstetricians, we're looking at gynecologists, but then how many of these are available in the healthcare setting? Dr. Robert spoke about that, of the ratio. Um, there is a higher ratio or lower ratio of um, healthcare, healthcare workers to, 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 to the patients. So these are some of the challenges that we're grappling with. Then of course, the low quality of eutrotonics. Um, several papers speak about um, how they are not as effective in managing PPH, right? And then we have the untimely intervention when PPH arises. For example, um, we've been in the theater before and um, a woman is just bleeding and we don't know she's bleeding until we realize later on when she's at the verge of death. But many of these aspects could be controlled. So we then looked at a standard of care called the bimanual fundal compression. So now what happens here is, um, Immediately, a woman gives birth and the placenta is removed. So the doctors realize that she has gotten, she's getting, she has PPH. And um, remember, uterine atony is failure of the uterus to contract. So what happens is um, the arteries are literally oozing blood. So the, the healthcare practitioner has to insert his hand through the vaginal canal. And the other hand is pressing on the fundus. So the fundus is this um, section you see, sorry about that. The fundus is this section you see over here. The point here is just to exert pressure on the uterine wall so that we can block the arteries and then stop bleeding. Now, as you see this exactly, I just want to start from the last point I have. It's extremely painful. You know, um, this is a, a wonderful image over here, but when you get into the labor wards and you witness this experience, it's, it's a different, um, like you can imagine what the women are going through, right? And also it's invasive. But now, um, when you look at the invasiveness here, we're looking at um, a healthcare, say a hospital, a healthcare facility that is deep in the rural areas, whereby gloves are a challenge, you know, access to gloves is an issue um, where we, we, we question the cleanliness. So you can imagine putting your hand in there and um, there is a lot of infection that may come in hand in line with this. Then we look at labor intensive. Many of the times we're in the fit, um, in the labor ward, we realized that it was not the women that were doing this procedure and not to say that women are weak, but just to show you that it is labor intensive. And you could see that even the men were sweating when they were doing this procedure. And it only requires skilled personnel. Not anyone can do this. No, not, not any midwife can do this. It's only skilled personnel. And of course, the extremely painful part. So this is the standard of care when a woman has um, PPH. So this is what they do. So when we looked at all the dynamics, the literature, when we were on the ward, um, interaction with our clinical PI, Dr. Sam Olonge, we realized and we're thinking about this, that the timely intervention of atonic PPH significantly reduces the incidence of death from PPH. Atonic PPH here, literally, I'm just, we, it's a term that we got from uterine atony. So in other words, failure of the uterus to contract. And we're just thinking timely intervention can actually significantly reduce the incidence of death from PPH. So this led us to the maternal PPH wrap, a device that you can see. This is one of um, our participants in the, the study. So the device is basically a local technology. It's non-invasive, as you can see, and it's a pneumatic device. In other words, it uses pressure, and it exerts pressure on the uterus. So what we were doing here is we thought, um, can we, because we realized and recognized that Okay, great. Hello. Okay. I hope am I audible? Yes, we can hear you again now. Okay. If you just want to start at the beginning of your slide again, Maureen, that would be wonderful. All right then. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm shifting from here. So we're looking at timely intervention of atonic PPH, and we're looking at factoring this in in the significant reduction of um 
Apologies, the incident today Maureen. for PPH. Sorry, so this led us to the maternal PPH wrap. Maureen, we, we can't see your slides. Would you be able to share your screen again? That'd be great. Thank you. Okay. okay, just give me a second. So sorry to interrupt. It's okay. Lovely. All right then. So, um, so we came up with a PPH wrap device and it's the dark, it's a navy blue device that you see wrapped around this lady's abdomen. So um, it's basically made up of local materials. We're looking at um, polyurethane coated nylon fabrics, an inflatable air bladder, a squeeze bulb and an anaerobe gauge. And um, some of these were, were aspects that you find in, um, in a stethoscope. So um, what we were basically looking at is how can we mimic by manual fundal compression, but looking at it externally. Remember, by manual fundal compression is an internal procedure. So we asked ourselves, can we mimic this, but rather have it done externally? So what happens is um, the device is wrapped around the woman's lower abdomen. As you can see, it is exactly what it is, you know? And um, the amazing thing about this device is that it does not necessarily require a skilled personnel. So anyone can do that. Now here we were looking at, um, at doing away with certain aspects of the, fundal the bimanual fundal compression um, entails. For example, it can only be performed by skilled personnel. So we asked ourselves, can we do this, but can anyone do this? So um, what happens is in, it's um, inflated using a squeeze bulb to an order of 120 millimeters of mercury that is maintained within the bladder as monitored using a pressure guard that is attached. So we have a pressure gauge that's over here. Then we have this, the, there is a bladder over here. And then we have the material, and then we also had um, um, a couple of points here, the pressure points on the side. So we're just looking at how we can narrow down or squeeze the fundus, because it had to literally mimic by manual fundal compression. So when we, I just wanted to hint on this because I thought this was pretty important when we're talking about medical devices, and um, the purpose of the work that we did at the end of the day was to get into the market. So there is an entire translational pathway. We had the idea, we developed the prototype, we did the preclinical studies. The preclinical studies were done in, um, in um, a couple of facilities and even in labs. Then we had um, the regulatory and ethics review this Oh, um, might be able to speak about that later on. Um, but when we're talking about medical devices, depending on the class, we have different stages of clinical trials, but all of these have to begin with a pilot study. So this is where we are. So the aims and objectives that we came up with were as follows. So our aim was to conduct a pilot study to evaluate the viability of the maternal PPH wrap as an interventional device for reducing postpartum hemorrhage from an atonic uterus after delivery. And so these were our objectives. The first objective was to evaluate the acceptability and usability of the maternal PPH wrap among healthy women who are not at risk of PPH. We call this the normal bleeding. And the second objective was to evaluate the preliminary performance of the maternal PPH wrap on women with mild postpartum hemorrhage. I've talked about mild PPH, that is bleeding between 500 to close to 1000. But um, interaction with some of our nurses, we realized something that mild PPH can literally be when a woman bleeds beyond 200. Because we had incidences whereby the bleeding was so minimal, literally maybe 50 mils of blood or even less or even nothing. So um, because of the experience, when a woman, when, when, when they notice that it can even be 200 mils of blood. So that is actually an onset of PPH. And sometimes you cannot argue with, with experience. So um, what we needed to do, of course, is to get ethical clearance from the SOMREC, that's the, the Macquarie University School of Medicine Research and Ethics Committee. And then this was later on cleared by the Uganda National Council of Science and Technology to be able to progress with the study. And this was our methodology. So. Um, our study site was Kawempe National Referral Hospital. And um, I just want to speak to why we chose that hospital. It's because um, it follows the active management of third stage of labor protocol 
as recommended by the WHO. And we were so assured that there would be blood transfusion services. Remember, um, when it comes to um, DPH, one of the, one of the um, treatment modules is actually um, blood transfusion. So then we also knew that they have surgical facilities. So peradventure, a woman gets PPH and later on she needs to be taken to the theater for operation. So we knew that was settled, that was there. Then we're looking at the sample size. So our sample size was 40, but this 40 was divided. We had the 20 bathing women who later on were also divided into two groups. So we had group one and group two that I'll speak about shortly. And then we had the 20 healthcare workers. Out of these 20 healthcare workers, we had five of them who are, who are working on ground. We call them the, the clinical team. So they were working on ground and they were applying the device on the women. And then the other 15 were more like observing. Then all the results at the end of the day, we used um, Stata to analyze it. So what was our inclusion and exclusion criteria? So this was the general inclusion and exclusion that we took at first. And then later on, when we were looking at group one and then we we're looking at group two, the inclusion and exclusion criteria changed a bit. So here we have, for starters, they had to be 18 years and above, nothing less than that. So they had to be in labor, four to six centimeters of cervical dilation, expecting vaginal birth. So they had to be hemodynamically stable. Um, so here we're looking at um, vital signs. We had to monitor the vital signs. Of course, here we're looking at blood pressure, we're looking at heart rate, we're looking at oxygen saturation. But I just wanted to speak to um, how we were able to get these, these women. I'll speak to that in just a while. So we talk, I talked about the objectives. So our first objective was usability and acceptability. So usability basically is the use, how the midwives were using the device. Remember that that um, the target group that we were looking at using the device were actually the midwives. But then the beneficiaries of this would actually be the women. So usability, who was using, we were, these were the 20, the 20 midwives. Okay, the 20 midwives. Then when we're looking at acceptability, we're looking at um, will the women accept the device? But also, this was also attached to the nurses. Will the nurses accept the, the device? Because we did not want to introduce a device that will be that will add to the work of the clinicians, then that will be totally rejected. So these are some of the dynamics that come into play when you are designing a medical device or when you're solving problems generally, human-centered design. So then we looked at the third objective, which was the pre preliminary performance. Now here we're looking at, does this device actually reduce on the blood loss? or does it increase on the blood loss, right? So here we had group one and then group two. So this was the procedure. So the maternal PPH device was applied on to the woman's belly after delivering the placenta. So what happens is after the woman delivers the placenta, immediately we come in and we put the underbuttock drip. So the underbuttock drip is what you see over here, the blue, um, the blue collection funnel over here. So now remember, we're looking at how we can collect blood. And um, um, when you go through the literature, when you go to the healthcare facilities, many times it's by observation, but we could not do observation in this study. We needed to know how much are these women actually losing. So this was the underbuttle trip. So immediately after delivering the placenta, we put the drip and then we put the device, right? So here um, it is in these stages where by usability, acceptability and the performance were assessed, but how are they assessed? So for starters, the data collected from the women in groups one and two of the study included age. So we had um, data prior to, and this included age. So we wanted to find out what's their age, what's their gravity. Gravity is um, how many births have they had prior to. Gestation age of the pregnancy, blood glucose levels and baby status at birth. So how was this important? Um, being an engineer and, and getting involved in, um, in what the midwives do was actually amazing because we got to understand some of these dynamics. At the end of the study, we could actually read a chat, um, the, the chat that the doctors uh, you know, prescribed to the mothers. So age was a factor in PPH. Um, usually the older women were more likely to get postpartum hemorrhage, gravity. If we interfaced with some women that had close to five babies or six or eight, we knew that these ones were likely. So we marked them out, okay? Then baby status at birth. So some women actually had still births. So we also knew that, ah, this was actually, um, these ladies were actually likely to get PPH. So these were women that we marked out in the labor ward, right? So 
I'm just going to continue. Aha. Uh -huh. So now, um, one of the other things that we looked at was vital signs. So we did not only take vital signs in the beginning when we were just recruiting them for the study, but vital signs were being taken throughout the study. So vital signs, as I said, um, the blood pressure, systolic and diastolic, the pulse rate, the temperature, oxygen saturation, and respiratory rate. So the volume of the blood collected as well in calibrated under battle drips, indicating blood loss, and then the pain. We wanted to know, are you feeling pain? Are you, are you comfortable? Is, is there a heat buildup? Are you able to breathe? So all these, um, as we're applying our device, remember this pressure being exerted on the belly of the woman. So we knew that these might come in, this might come in with certain changes in her body. For example, her breathing might change. For example, she might feel pain. And so these aspects came in when we're looking at the acceptability of the device. But later on, I'll also speak about this when we come to the results. So all this, I'm looking, I'm talking about the vital signs, I'm talking about the blood loss. All this were monitored and recorded every 20 minutes for close to two hours. It was a hectic process, but we had to do it in order to get the results that we did. So now I want to speak to group one and group two. Um, so group one was a group that had normal bleeding. And normal bleeding was just really normal bleeding. It didn't reach 500. It actually almost didn't reach 300. It was like literally maybe 50 thereabout. So immediately the woman delivered the placenta. We put them, we gave them the wrap. And, um, and in this group, she was excluded if she began to experience PPH. At that moment, we excluded them. And um, it was in this stage whereby we monitored the acceptability. How did they find the device? I talked about that earlier. Then group two here, we had the mild PPH group. Now, this is where objective three was being assessed. So now, very importantly, is the mild PPH group was divided into two. We had the active group, and then we had the control group. So what happened in the active group is we had the standard protocol for PPH management, which was comprised of um, giving them the uterotonics, all right? Um, and then they received the PPH device. But remember that each and every woman that comes to the labor ward gets the saline. So saline was a constant. Then when it came to the control group, here we had, they only received the standard protocol for PPH management. And then we assessed the results from these two. So a woman was excluded from group two if the blood loss exceeded 1000 milliliters of blood or the cause of PPH was later determined that it was not uterine atony. For example, we have a case of um, placenta previa whereby the placenta um, does not properly detach from the uterine wall. So that was another, that's, that's another cause of PPH that we did not factor in. So, um, so just take a look at that. So now when it came to the results, uh, this was the amazing part. So results one were assessing device acceptability. So here we had, um, we're looking at um, the device being unwrapped during inflation. What happened? What did they think? What did they feel? What did they, their perception of it? The long time of application, um, whether the bleeding increased, whether there was discomfort, whether there was increased pain, what did they think about the color? And as you can see, for example, from the graph here, when it came to the color, they liked the color. When it came to the texture, it was, you know, they liked it a lot. That means it was not creating any kind of tension around their bellies. When it came to the elastic bands, they, they, they actually liked it a lot because we noticed that um, women generally in Africa tie their stomachs with a cloth after giving birth. You know, so this literally, they related this maternal PPH wrap to the experience that they have after giving birth when they tie the, the, the cloth around their bellies. So the, the purpose of the elastic band was to keep the fundus in place, okay? So then we also had pressure points, as I said earlier. Same point here is to keep the fundus in place and they liked this a lot. It's interesting to note that some of the women after the study wanted to buy the device, like it was that exciting, but then of course we couldn't give it to them. So now when it came to assessing usability, here we're looking at what the, the, the clinicians, the midwives in particular thought about the device, the length of time to wrap the device around the patient. Um, we're looking at um, the bleeding increased on device application, whether the device had the patient on application, whether they had challenges of wrapping the device around the patient. So the results here literally were almost all either strongly disagree or disagree. And this was for all the nurses, whether they were study nurses or whether they were just observant nurses. So many of them found the device, it was easy to wrap around the patient. The only challenge came in when it came to cleaning of the device, but this is something that we're working on 
or we're looking at working on the next stage of the study. So this was also a very amazing part to look at is preliminary performance. So what were we looking at here is whether there was a reduction in blood loss. Now, when you look at this graph and just something I hinted on here is the reduction in blood loss was detected between the 80th and the 120th minute. When you look at this here, we're looking at blood volume changes over time. When you look at the 80th minute, okay, when you look at the beginning here, zero to the 80th, we look at the active group. Remember the active group had the, the RAP as well as the standard of care. The control group only had the standard of care. So when you look at this, they all began at, it, was, it began high from the active group compared to the control group. But then, now this is the blood volume, right? This is the mean blood volume. But then when you look at the 80th minute, there was a significant drop. 708 over here, 725 over here. And you can just look at that continuously. So what we realized from this is that this device actually reduced on the blood loss of the women. And um, we saw that from the results, but we also thought, saw that from the experiences of the women, and um, especially during the whole um, um, excessive bleeding. Then we also looked at um, comparing misoproto use in active and then the control groups. Now, remember, as I said earlier, um, the saline was given to all women. It's like a standard of care. Now, when it came to the control group and then the active group, and we're looking at comparing misoproto use, we noticed that there was a significant reduction in blood loss when misoproto was used in the active group compared to when it was used in the control group. You can just see that over here. We had 640 milliliters of blood, averagely, and compared to the control group, which was 800, and both of them had misoproto. Remember, the standard of care was retained for both, but in the active group, the device was applied. So we noticed that. Now, I just wanted to speak to something as I conclude concerning the systems approach to innovation. And this is something that Dr. Robert had spoken about. Um, this innovation did begin from the research terrain, but at the end of the day, we're looking at moving it to the market. And um, systems approach involves the business bit of it, the feasibility. Okay, we have identified that the device is actually very feasible. There is a desirability aspect to it. In other words, um, there is a problem and um, this is the solution. And then we're looking at the impact, but also we're looking at the multi, the multi stakeholder, the multidisciplinary stakeholder approach when it comes to innovation. So this led me to, to add a couple of slides here. So our progress made so far. So this project began from school. It began um, um, Dr. Robert's students and um, prototype development and free clinical testing. So between 2016 and 2018, this was really what we were about. In 2019, we secured intellectual property and then we launched a, non, a not for profit organization called Principality Medtech. Then in 2020, we were able to conduct the pilot stroke feasibility study and we had that completed. Now, this is our plan moving forward because at the end of the day, um, we need to see that innovations that we come up with reach the desired population. Otherwise, then why are we innovating in the first place? So next up, we have a complete, we need to conduct the next stage of the clinical trial, which will involve more participants, which will involve um, prototype enhancement. There are a couple of ch changes that we need to make on the device moving forward. So these will need to be done prior to the clinical trial. And then later on, we need to obtain regulatory approval. Um, at the end of the day, we either need to get a, an FDA or a CE mark attached to our device. And then in 2030, we're looking at launching into the market. It looks like a long way between now and then, but um, it does take time to get it right in the medical device field. It does take time and we appreciate the time that comes into play in this. Then I just wanted to speak to the route to the market and what we had envisioned moving forward. So um, we're looking at this device costing less than 100 USD. <clears throat> And with bulk purchases, we know that this will significantly reduce. Now, um, initially we're looking at um, how we can get this device into the government so that it is more like it is in every healthcare facility, it is in every healthcare center, whether it's a healthcare center one or two or three or four, it is available because at the end of the day, we're looking at, can this device actually be used by um, not, um, anybody, whether it's a midwife or whether it's a gynecologist, but can anyone use this device? And um, the potential of this device can actually reach beyond 1,600 lives saved by year. And at the end of the day, we're looking at approximately 15 million 
dollars of government expenses reduced per year. So many of these expenses go to, for example, the eutrotonics. We have the um, the blood transfusion services. We have the surgical procedures. So it's amazing that we had to think about this. But when you're looking at moving to the market, these are things that you have to factor in. So these are our references, and then these are. Um, the people that the companies, the organizations that have carried us from then till now. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, Maureen, for that fantastic talk. And thank you for all the contributions made uh, from all the other authors that are on the discussion talk today. Um, first of all, does anyone have any questions for Maureen? Okay, so Gerald Innocent has one question. She says, how long was the maternal PPH wrap kept on by the patient? Um, so we kept the device on for two hours uh, because we're monitoring it every 20 minutes. I'd hinted on that in the, in the slides. Yeah, so it's two hours. And um, my question for you, Maureen, was about, um, and you alluded that that was a, a change you were going to make to the prototype and model, but is there, is there going to be um, a washable or wipeable model so you can uh, remove the fabric and wash it? Or how is it going to be? All right. Um, so initially, we thought that we could actually just wipe the device, just wipe it. But then we noticed that the material was seeping in blood. So we had to actually wash it. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's an idea that was brought forward in one of the conferences we attended of just having another external um, wrapping. And then, so we have another external wrapping and then the, the wrap is actually inside it. But it's something that we're still, we're still pondering on. Thank you so much. But my team is available so they can definitely chip in and answer some of the questions as well. Thank you. Great. So uh, does anyone want to answer the next question, which is why did the patients want to take the device on? So did they feel like it would be more comfortable for them to have it on after discharge? All right. Um, um, Solomon, Dennis, Owen, would you like to take that? Yes, so I think this is, yeah. this is Dennis. Yeah, one of the reasons as to why uh, let's say the participants like the device was, like Maureen said, uh, locally, the mothers tend to wrap their babies with probably um, a sheet or anything that can help them reduce the pain. And then the strappings, or let's say the elastic bands of the device actually do that to even a greater extent. So what came out of uh, our study or an observation and also comments from the participants was that the moment the device was applied, there was significant reduction in pain. And definitely that already tra translates as something good for them. And they wanted to keep the device on even after the study time, which is 120 minutes. So at the end of the 120 minutes, if there is uh, or there was contestation, you have to remove the device, but the mother still feels comfortable and pain-free or pain relief. So definitely, uh, once the device was removed, there was still um, some, I would say, commented that the pain was back. So uh, why they really wanted to take the device was because they already saw a difference in the pain relief. Thank you. That's a really interesting sub outcome. Um, Dr. Billy is joining us from Mango Hospital. Good morning, or oh, good afternoon, Billy. Could you uh, tell us yes. your question? Yes, good afternoon, how are you doing? Nice to see you, thank you for joining us. Yes, now my question is, are there some patients who had to put on that device and after two hours, the bleeding continued or it was very effective that none of the patients had continued bleeding after 120 minutes? Thank you. All right, um, thank you, Dr. Billy. Um, we did have cases whereby um, there was prolonged, those were rare, but I, I, there was prolonged bleeding, but more like excessive bleeding. But then when we, when we evaluated 
what was the cause of that? It was not the uterine atony. It was more than that. So these ladies had to get into theater for that. So, um, so some of the challenges that we realized, and maybe let me just switch the challenges, is um, sometimes we could re recruit a woman, she gets PPH, and then she's bleeding excessively. And then later on we realize, oh wow, she has a tear. And immediately we notice she has a tear. We notice that the bleeding now is not coming from the, the, the arteries, the, the uterine, you know, the, the uterine wall. Now it's coming from the tear in the vaginal opening. So immediately we had to disqualify those participants. So there were some of those challenges whereby we start the study, later on we realize, oh, she's bleeding more than usual. We check and we find out it's actually another cause. So we have to disqualify. So there were those cases as well. I hope that answers you. Okay, um, Kathy, there are other questions in the chat here. Can we just go through them? You're muted if you're speaking, but okay, cool. Oh, sorry, I was just, Mwanja Moses was just asking, uh, thank you, Mwanja Moses, uh, does it tend to replace uterotonics? I think that was the control group. Am I right? Um, I beg your pardon. Um, Moses was asking, does it replace uterotonics? And I think you were saying in your trial that the control group and was the group that received the standard care as per who guideline. Yes. So, um, so the we retained the use of the uterotonics in all the groups. The only change we had was in group one. Um, this was um, this, the, the active group, right? And so the active group had the maternal PPH wrap in addition to the uterotonics, okay? And then it is in, group, it is in the control group that only had the uterotonics. But at the end of the day, we are not looking at changing the standard of care. The standard of care is a standard of care, proven and tested. Right, but we're looking at how can we improve the outcomes, or how can we? Um, I talked about something earlier that um, many times when a woman gets PPH, the intervention is the by manual compression. Many times there is no skilled personnel. Many times um, um, there there may be no gloves. We know that there may be no gloves, right? Um, many of us that are in Uganda know that, that situation in the setting. So we're looking at, can this device be applied externally as perhaps the patient is being taken to the, as a theater that has, or maybe um, a healthcare facility that has a, a surgery or a theater, something of that sort. So we are not looking at replacing uterotonics. Those are absolutely necessary. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, the next question from the chat group before we go back to the raised hands was, how did you measure the blood loss, Maureen? So I believe it was with the under drape, under buttock drape. Did, did you measure it on the weighing scale? No, we did not. So um, thank you, Kathy, for that. So there are many ways of measuring the, um, the um, blood loss. There is the observation, which is, of course, subjective. Um, then we have the, the cotton, so dipping cotton and then and then taking that to a weighing scale. But all of these aspects are very subjective. So we wanted to use something that we could prove it. So as you can see, what, what our midwife did over here, we also had to do this procedure, is we literally had to pull the blood. Because one, one of the things we realized later on is that the, the beds were not designed for the under buttock drip. So we had to improvise. You can imagine this drip was supposed to be facing the back, but it had to be put on the side. And then we had to, at some point, lift the lady up and then pull the blood into the drip so that we can get accurate measurements. So those were some of the challenges we had in the study. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that's really important in terms of practical, uh, practical research and really lots of things learned. Hey, um, Dr. Billy, uh, can I go back to you? Have you got another question? I beg your pardon? Have you got another question? No, I, I was answered. 
the question was okay. answered well. Okay. Yes. Thank, uh, you thank you. Thank you. What about Helen? Helen, do you have a question? Yes. Um, thank you so much, Maureen, for explaining your um, study. It's really interesting. Um, I have a question either you can answer or any of the other engineers on the group. Um, I just wanted to ask how you found the experience of working in a clinical trial as an engineer. Um, I know there's a lot um, going on in the interface between uh, my biomedical engineering and surgery. And um, I think there's a lot of opportunities there, but I'm sure there's also challenges um, to working together. So I just wondered um, if you or anyone else in the group here have come across certain challenges um, working between engineering and surgery and um, any ways you've found to overcome those. Um, all right, I, I can begin. I can answer, I can begin. And then I so um, I think initially it was a little bit challenging because um, first of all, getting into a labor ward is an entirely interesting experience. And um, it took us, it personally took me some time to adjust to what was happening. But then as you keep on, as you keep on going there and challenging yourself, it gets, it got better. So we were able to, as I said, we ended up learning how to read the patient chats. But then very importantly, is just learning how to work together with them, um, with, with um, other practitioners. Because um, as an engineer, and I guess this is something that stood out for me in this entire project and birthed a certain mentality that I have, is that um, we cannot work in silos as engineers. So at the end of the day, we need to get the doctors on board and understand how do they do what they do. Now, it is only by getting into the ward that, that my eyes were opened to other challenges that the nurses are facing. For example, the, the drip. If we were not part of this project here, we would not understand that the beds are actually not designed for the drapes. You know, we would not understand that, okay, um, um, there are a couple of other challenges that the midwives go through. For example, I'm one midwife in a, in, a, in a room of close to five women. So we had to put those, we had to factor in those things that are we designing an innovation that at the end of the day will, um, will add to the work of the already um, um, overloaded clinicians or are we simplifying their workload at the end of the day? You know, so I just think uh, to me, this was a learning lesson um, of how important it is for us to work together, especially if we're looking at, at solving problems. You need to know what the doctors are going through, what the midwives are going through, what the women are going through, who are the players in your field. And um, I think that's one of the ways we're going to, it, it's, it's, it allows impact. So it's easy for your innovation to be accepted and adapted at the end of the day. So that's what I have to say for starters. Thank you so much. I think someone else can go in. Thank you. Well, I, I just want to, to, to build on Maureen's uh, responses. Yes, uh, to me, it was really adrenaline-like experience, you know, never been in this kind of emergency situations when uh, someone is, or, or their life is on a, a hinge, I must say. So, but it also made us to appreciate uh, human-centered design approach because as an engineer, ideally, you are a problem solver most of the time. And when you innovate, you, you're most likely not going to be perhaps the end user of this particular product. So part of the idea appreciate the human-centered design. And we know that there's high per patient to health workers ratio in Uganda. So our product really should not be, be having these midwives, these understaffed midwives, a lot of work or a lot of procedures for them to do. So those are some of the little, little um, attributes we were, we were able to appreciate from this experience and also appreciate the importance of working in a multidisciplinary aspect. Just like Maureen said, yeah, we were after the end of the hotel, we were now comfortable with the, reading some of the patient chats that uh, with the, you know, the, how the doctors scribble their handwritings, whatever. Yeah, we were able to, to get such of the things. Uh, Really amazing experience, I can say.
Well done. I imagine as well, Solomon, it's difficult if you've never seen that much blood before, uh, because being in an environment where there is an emergency going on and lots of blood being lost, some people can feel quite faint and unwell. So um, well done. <laughs> I had a question actually, if, if you don't mind Maureen, because um, thinking from a perspective of, um, we've got a few people on the call here today who are obstetricians um, and we manage PPH every day. Um, I just wanted to know how you came up with the idea of 120 millimeters of mercury being the right pressure to put on the uterus. Um, was this from other medical devices similar in the field or was this from um, a particular research study. All right, thank you so much, Kathy, for that. Um, I would, um, I think I would like um, Den Dennis to answer that and then I can chip in later on. Over to you, Dennis. All right, thanks. Thanks, Kathy. So definitely uh, through the device development, we've done a number of uh, letters, research, reading around journal articles, papers, and finding what is safe enough to be applied around the pelvic region, around the abdominal region, and also looking at majorly other devices that are trying to do the same thing as, we are, as we, our innovation is doing. So we looked at uh, studies that were made by the NASG, the non-nematic and shock gamut, and then there was also the nematic and shock gamut. So all these uh, devices are also modalities that were innovated to try and reduce uh, postpartum hemorrhage uh, secondary to uh, atonic and atonic uterus. So definitely uh, we looked at what are the pressures that were exerted by these devices and what were the safe limits. So in particular, the pneumatic and shock gamut uh, actually did these studies in the 1980, 89, 88. One of the journal articles and papers uh, published indicated that the safe pressure that they came up with was 125. So 125 millimeters of mercury was the safest pressure to apply around the pelvic region. Otherwise, they had uh, other consequences that came in uh, when they exceeded the, these pressures. So with the same, and also with the mimic, or let's say uh, one thing that also Maureen talked about was the device design went through a series of tests in the laboratory. So we did some tests in the laboratory and we kind of saw what the pressure looks like um, internally in the abdomen. So we used models like the Mama Natali, we also built our own simulation model to look at how are these pressures going to be exerted on the uterus uh, when we apply the device. So definitely we saw that actually uh, when we apply a lot of pressure in using the models that we had, one that we built and also the Mama Natali, we may actually cause harm to the underlying organs. And that's how we went ahead and uh, reviewed extra literature, look at what is recommended and what um, the pneumatic and choke garment actually uh, found out. So when we benchmarked with that, and then we said, okay, let's look at uh, the self pressure and let's not exceed the self pressure that was uh, already reported by the uh, pneumatic and choke garment. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I would imagine they, they were worried about the risk of blood clots in the lower limbs and things like that. If you exceed the pressure too high, there could be a risk of cutting off blood supply. Um, but ultimately, another thing that we do in PPH management is aortic compression. Um, so, I, I, you know, I do think that it all makes sense, really, uh, what you're getting at in terms of the device. And I think particularly related to low middle income setting, it is important um, to have a device which doesn't increase the risk of infection, as you say, Maureen, um, because that's a massive factor. Um, and things like the Bakri balloon or the um, balloon that goes inside the uterus is definitely used for atony as well. Um, uh, but, you know, because it's inside the, the woman, it's, there's an increased risk of, of bleeding there. Um, can I ask, is there any more questions for Maureen and the team?
excuse me, Kathy. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, um, I remember the current uh, the current uh, training we had in Brighton. On the sideline, I was talking to one Dr. Khan. He has done lots of uh, um, abdominal surgeries and uh, trauma. He was an expert in trauma, trauma surgeon. So he was he was talking about that even if you have a, a cloth, because I think he, has, he was in the military and he, he had practiced this maybe in a, in a non, not a, a proper way, but he, it was effective that even if you have a cloth, which you can tie around the uterus and keep it not to move up, you can also do. Because sometimes the, the problem will be um, accessing those gadgets when, when the pattern is out and you know coming out. So uh, will there be available to everyone, maybe more especially in the low resource centers? Are there any other alternatives of them in case, because the aim is to reduce uterine atom. Thank you. I think certainly when you're in a setting where there is a lack of healthcare staff, that this device is acting as somebody providing compression on the uterus when perhaps the staffing ratio is more than one to one, which is common in most health settings, but more common in uh, low resource setting. Um, so I guess Billy's question was about the availability, the wide availability. How many of these devices do you imagine being in the different hospitals, Maureen? How, how, how do you envisage, uh, you know, by 2030, what are, you, what are your hopes for the PPH belt? Tell us. Thank you, Kathy. Um, thank you, Dr. Billy. Um, I'm, I'm just going to say something, then I think Owen or Dennis will come in and add on. Um, when we were doing um, our business analysis, we were looking at close to five devices per ward, um, because again, we're aware that um, of the frequency, for example, when you're looking at Kawempe National Referral Hospital, the number of mothers that come in is is um, it's really huge. And um, so we need to cater for those possibilities, but also looking at the fact that the, the device needs to be clean, that is time that is taken. So we need to have many, many of those devices available at every at every particular time. So we're looking at having, it's five devices, but more like per cubic or per ward. In, in Kawempe, there are four wards, four partitions in the labor ward. So we're looking at literally having five per partition per labor ward, if that makes sense. But Owen and Dennis can just add on to that. Thank you so much. Yes, just to supplement on what Maureen has said, also uh, one of the things that we considered uh, during the uh, device development, we looked at actually um, having the device also used in ambulance services, uh, in cases of referral. So definitely we are looking at having the device as cheap as possible uh, so that it can be easily afforded by even the let's say the first level um, clinic that can uh, give delivery services. Uh, definitely it will be a device that can uh, apply, can be applied by anyone. In other words, you do not need as much uh, training. So you will need instructions as the patient is being referred to the nearest referral hospital or for further management, definitely you are preserving or you're reducing on the blood loss. So we look at having um, the device readily available in the markets, just like you see uh, BP, BPs. So definitely something like that. Uh, however, we also know that, okay, um, will, will there be, or will, will the device be misused? So we have to get a balance between the two. If it, it's extremely readily available. Will it be misused? We've, all, we've already noted that if mothers want to remain with the device because of just uh, uh, reducing the pain, so it could be also a misuse. So we need to debate those as we go ahead with the device design. Thank you.
Yeah, interesting sub finding definitely that it reduces pain. Um, I'm just seeing in the chat box. Um, okay, I think we've answered all the questions there. So we're going to bring this meeting to a close now. I'd like to thank our speakers and contributors um, to this chat today. I think we have found um, out a lot um, about the use of medical devices um, and how many devices are, um, you know, maybe in the hospitals, but completely out of use um, or <clears throat> not able to be repaired and how important it is now um, in the biomedical engineering field that their mandate is to ensure that uh, the majority of medical devices in hospitals are um, in good use and good working condition, as Dr. Robert said. And then moving on to our second talk from, Dr., from Maureen, thank you so much. Um, it's been really great to hear about innovation um, of medical devices that can be used in a practical sense um, with an MDT uh, of workers uh, contributing um, in order to reduce PPH and ultimately reduce obstetric hemorrhage and reduce obstetric mortality. So thank you so much for your contributions. Um, on behalf of the whole GASOC committee, we're really delighted that we've been able to hold this journal club today. Please, um, Watch out for it uh, on our YouTube channel. It will become available for everybody to watch. Um, and shortly we will be releasing um, the date for our national GASOC conference in October. So we'd be um, really, really overwhelmed and, and happy if some of you could join us for that and details will be posted on our website. Um, so without further ado, thank you very much. Have a great day. And um, just, yeah, thanks to all the contributors. Cheers. All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Bye. It's been a pleasure. Thanks very much for chairing, Kathy. That's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel.